Let's get it. This is Life's Essential Ingredients with Jeff and a mic, where we hope to inform, inspire, and transform lives one essential ingredient at a time. Welcome to the show. Listeners, thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Life's Essential Ingredients. I still got to pinch myself a little bit. Uh, Can't believe that I'm actually doing this. We are in season two. This is episode 32. I'm with Dr. Rick Cromey coming from Star, Idaho. Uh, And man, we are in for a treat. Uh, My Pasho is still on vacation. And like I mentioned, I'm just coming back from a long uh, time away doing the Camino de Santiago, walking with my beautiful wife. 31 straight days uh, through Spain and so I'm so excited to be back and uh, we are in for a treat so first of all where you can find our guest uh, best way he's got a bunch of different sites and he does a whole bunch but is just go to his main website Rick chromey.com and i'm going to spell it out r-i-c-k-c-h-r-o-m-e-y.com so a little bit about our guest Dr. Rick Cromie is a cultural explorer, social historian, generational futurist, and international keynote speaker. A best-selling author, he has penned over a dozen books on leadership, natural motivation, creative communication, and classroom management. His most recent work, Gen Tech, an American story of technology change and who we really are, is available online and in bookstores everywhere. His book is an engaging romp that explores why labeling people with terms like baby boomer or Gen X or millennial or Gen Z just doesn't work, which I love and I totally agree with. Rather, Dr. Cromie explores the technology we encounter between the ages of 10 and 25, our coming of age years. This technological frame better helps leaders, teachers, and parents to understand where we all fit and the assets, I love that, we bring into the boardroom, classroom, or home. Rick has served as a pastor, professor, speaker, trainer, and consultant working in nonprofit and corporate sectors. In 2017, he founded MANA Educational Services International to inspire and equip leaders, teachers, pastors, and parents. Rick holds a doctorate in leadership and emerging culture and travels the U.S. and the world to speak on culture, faith, history, education, and leadership topics. Rick, thanks for dedicating your life's work to helping people grow into their best selves and welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Jeff, and I appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm going to have to shorten it. That uh, there's a lot there to chew on, isn't there? Uh, no, I don't think I don't think you have to. That's one of the highlights for me, to be honest, is introducing people because I think it's really important for the listeners to understand a little bit of who you are uh, and what is essential in your life. And if we were to spend, we could spend an hour just picking apart certain words in your introduction. And I loved a whole bunch of them, but natural motivation is intriguing uh, to me. You know, uh, assets that we bring into the boardroom and really fascinated to to get into this with you of the uh, encounter between the ages of 10 and 25. And and that's kind of how we're going to communicate and figure out how we fit in. Uh, There's a whole bunch to explore there. And then just seeing that you do work all over the world, um, which... Uh, I know you speak on culture, but anytime we're blessed to travel, you're forced. Hopefully you can get out of your own way and forced to really look at, hey, what is this culture? You know, my wife and I always have a house rule. Most of the time it works out. But when we travel, we don't take a car. We we ride the bus um, with what everybody else does. Uh, and so we get to know the people and get to see uh, life from a different perspective, which is what made the Camino de Santiago. And then we'll get into into you, Rick. But what made that so special is you're walking. And so when you're walking, you're not running, uh, you're walking. And so you're forced to just really see uh, the world from such a different way and to really appreciate even just passing someone, you know, and on the Camino, you people that have walked it, I'm sure they're sick of it, but you say Buen Camino, Uh, at least I did. I'm like a hello guy to everybody. Uh, And I would say that. And really when you're saying that, 
you're bringing it from your heart and soul saying, Hey, I wish you this great journey, you know, and for me today. Uh, and so, man, I'm excited, um, because that in, in, in looking, uh, and studying you seems like how you live your life and the message that you share with people all over the world. Yeah, exactly. And you know, what's interesting about that word journey is you can't spell it without the word joy in the middle of it. You know, it starts and ends the whole journey word is joy. And if you want to experience joy in life, go on a journey because that's really where it happens. Uh, you know, my I've been very blessed. I, I grew I grew up in central Montana in a very small, um, you, know, you know, basically neighborhood and small town and had a had a family that didn't do a lot of traveling outside of Montana because we really couldn't afford it. But I always made a, a commitment to myself that if I could get out of Montana and experience the world, I wanted to do that. And my the last 40 years, 50 years have all been about traveling, seeing the United States. I've been to every state in the union, many more than once. And I've, I've been able to I've just been blessed uh, to have good friends. A lot of it's happened because I go speak places and they say, hey, do you want to see that spot? And I'll say, sure. You know, a couple summers ago, I was speaking for a church camp out in Iowa and the the host there said, hey, do you want to see where Buddy Holly was killed? And I said, absolutely. Let's go. And, you know, I got my picture by the big Buddy Holly glasses in an Iowa cornfield. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah. And that's what life is all about. It's about finding joy in the journey. And you don't have to go very far outside your backyard to find that joy. You know, maybe you can't travel a long ways. I've been blessed to go all over the world and see. I've seen Africa several times, all parts of Africa, and been blessed with that opportunity. But you don't have to go far outside your backyard. I live in Idaho. My backyard is the great Northwest, and they don't call it great for nothing. And so there's a lot of things to see here in Washington and Oregon, Idaho, you know, Nevada, California and such Montana where I'm from. Yeah. Oh man, it's going to be a great show. And it's crazy. We start off every episode with a thought of the day and I already know you're going to, we're a hundred percent. So I researched a guest and then I picked this quote and yeah, you can, there's, I don't know how many millions, trillions of quotes that I could pick. Um, but, uh, and you using that word journey, it's like, all right, I already know we got this one down. So we're still a hundred percent. And it's from Shirley McLean. And here it is without the recognition of the soul's journey within us, we are lost and only part of what we were intended to be. Mm -hmm. Why would I pick that one for you? Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that pretty much describes my life story. You know, it's been a journey of the soul, really. And, you know, people see the end result. They, they, they hear and see the resume that we have, that we bring to the table. And uh, they hear the stories of, of our achievements and, you know, accolades and such. But what they don't realize, Jeff, is that we go through a lot of pain to get there. Most of us who are, you know, if you're a writer, if you're an artist, if you're if, if you're a musician, if you're anybody that creates, um, most of our best creations come out of the darkness. You know, mo our best words come out of the pain that we have, that we bring to the table. And, you know, I think it'd be nice if we could all, I think that's why we resonate with so much of the music that's out there uh, or, or a particular piece of literature is, is because we, we sense the pain that was in the process. And for me, I just want to be real. I think authenticity is the heartbeat of, of a person, of who you really are. It's just learning to become real. And that's not an easy process because we live in a very fabricated, manufactured, plastic culture. And to become real means to be countercultural, really. It means to go against everything that's trying to frame you and make you more plastic, more robotic, more me mechanized, more machine, you might say, into something more human, more divine, mm. you know, it's more, more personal. Man, I don't, I don't want to, it's just a great segue to it, but, and I don't want to jump the gun, but, you know, in researching you and not knowing, I didn't have the good fortune of reading your book. And I know you're a historian, but I also know you're into technology and things. And where does technology fit as well as distract us from 
developing and appreciating that that journey because I'm I'm imagining you know and not to go back to the Camino but I'm so in that space still having the time to just think and kind of go through the pain what you were talking about is vital towards learning that appreciation of whatever journey you are on and so what is the mix with the influence of technology and being kind of just bathing in that 24 seven, you know, the average person is on their device for over 10 hours a day. And yeah, just, I don't want to talk too much, but yeah, make <laughs> sense of that to, to me of finding that, that balance. Well, that's a great question. And you actually ended with an interesting thought to begin with. So let's start with the end and move, move forward from okay. there. You know, you just said finding the balance. Let me argue that finding the balance is a myth. Mm. We, we are perfectly imbalanced when you think about it. Just look at biologically how we walk. You know, when you walk, you actually are putting one foot, you're swaying back and forth. Uh, if you want to exaggerate that, think about a person on a tightrope with a, with a big, long pole. They're constantly, you know, they're balancing. It's a balancing act, but they're constantly going left and right. And there are extremes depending on, you know, the wind and the different types of things that going on. Mm -hmm. If you're taking a step, you can actually put yourself a little bit out of balance. And that's probably one of the best ways to look at life is that we actually live and I would suggest thrive within chaos. If you look at the Internet at its basic, basic sense, it's a bunch of computers, random computers all over the world interacting with one another. And and yet, and yet, as you move away from it, as you, as you get further and further away from it, you start to see the the 30,000, 40,000, 100,000 you know, foot flyover view of the Internet. It's a beautiful, you know, flowing, fluid you know, type of, of almost an artwork, if you will, as these computers are all interacting with one another. So, you know, I, I, that's how I look at life when we're in the middle of it, when we when we focus solely on who we are and we're focused on just ourselves. And this is what happens when we get into our painful moments is we tend to go inside and just look at ourselves and we get into these pity parties and we look at, at, at man, look at what's going on with me. We got to get out of that. You know, one of the things that I did, I went through a very painful divorce about uh, seven, eight years ago. And one of the things that I did, I did two things to, to really get outside of myself and see it. First of all, I just started to serve. I found ways to serve people, get out there and do something, you know, give, give away. Do, even if you don't have a lot to give away, do something with your time, with your talent, with your treasure. The second thing I did was I just went on a, I called it a movie vacation. I couldn't afford a lot, but I could afford $5 Tuesdays at my local theater. And I went every Tuesday in the matinee in the middle of the afternoon. Nobody was there. And I just watched movie after movie after movie. I'd never done that before. And, you know, some of the stuff was, was, you yeah, know, okay. But there were some movies that, you know, looking back, I'm kind of glad I went and saw. They were not movies that I would have chosen initially, but they turned out to be great movies. And that was just one way for me to get outside of myself. And everybody's got to do that. As you go through life, we're in the middle of the thick of a lot of craziness a lot of chaos, get above that, get outside of it and see, see the world in a different way. That's why you have to travel, Jeff. I really believe travel helps you get outside that more than anything. You know, even if it's just uh, taking a little trip down to the, to the local, uh, you know, coffee shop. I mean, that's traveling in its, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And any, any, any chance you get to see life from a different perspective, uh, if you can get into that space, you know, I think that's just part of the challenge, whether we use the word chaos or peacefulness. I mean, it sounds like those can uh, be kind of yeah. interchanged uh, a little bit. Um, but I think it's just important to, to allow yourself to, to see different things and allow that to, for you to make sense of what you're seeing. Uh, right. And then to be able to tell that story and enjoy that. And, and one of the things in your intro that was a little bit interesting to me, I'm just going to read it again, that you explore the technology we encounter between the ages of 10 and 25. Uh, and then this uh, technological frame better helps leaders, teachers and parents to understand where we all fit in and the assets 
And that's what's fascinating to me. Uh, we bring into the boardroom uh, yeah. and so on and so forth. Explain that to me a little bit more. Well, for me, this whole concept kind of emerged. Uh, I, I'm a guy who likes to create theories. I just like to think about stuff and create theories about why things are happening, how things are happening. And um, several years ago, this has probably been almost 20 years ago now, I started to think about music. You know, just how, you know, the, why, did I, why do I listen to certain types of music? And it dawned on me, it was the music that was, I call it comfort music. It was the music I listened to between the ages of 10 and 25. You know, those coming of age years, those uh, we call it puberty. It's when we basically change biologically, we change, obviously, emotionally, we change, spiritually, we change, you know, mentally, there's a there's a huge shift in how we think about things. And, you know, it was in that process. And, and by the age of 25, pretty much there's a closing there of the, the end of puberty. I got thinking, well, you know, most of my music is the music that I listen to between the ages of 10 and 25. Well, what happened was later as I started to do um, more cultural analysis and I was looking at the big shifts initially, I mean, about every 500 years, we have these huge shifts. And I kept asking, why do we have these shifts? You know, you see the shift out of the ren out of the dark ages into the Renaissance period. Uh, you know, why do we have those huge shifts? And it, it dawned on me that it was technology that was driving it. And I call these the, the big techs or the mega techs in my work. And these, these megatechs have the ability to actually change cultural languages, how we communicate with one another, how we interact with one another, how we, you know, explore our worlds and understand our worlds. And when you look back at the, the 500 years or 600 years ago, it was the megatechs of the, the Gutenberg press, the printing press that did that. It was the mechanized clock that did that. It was the scopes, the telescope, the microscope that allowed us to see worlds we never imagined before, micro worlds as well as worlds out there in outer space that we just never imagined. So then I started thinking, well, are, what are the megatechs that are moving us out of this modern world into what we classically call a postmodern world today? You know, we, we hear those words, we go, what in the world? But there has been a huge shift, a shift just like we had five, 600 years ago as well. And that happens about every 500 years, we see these shifts. And it was television. Television really uh, changed our culture. It, it, it reinvented our culture. In fact, when you go into my book, Gen Tech, uh, three or four of the generations are directly related to television technology. It, it, it impacted even other micro generations as far as how they they were framed. Uh, but there was also uh, the cell phone. When you look at the cell phone, how that, you know, the phone itself was very revolutionary. But when the cell phone came along, it became mobile technology. Suddenly you could have a conversation anywhere, anytime. That was a shift before you had to go to a wall, you know, and, and put a phone to your ear and you had a cord there. You were still landlocked or as we used to call it landlined, you know, but that, that telephone, the mobile phone, the cell phone shifted. And then the final technology, of course, is the Internet. When you throw the Internet, cell phone and, and tel television together, those are the three megatechs that have, again, reinvented transformed our culture. And especially in the last few years, we've seen a transformational shift uh, from the pre-COVID world to this post-COVID world, which buckle up, buttercup, you haven't seen anything yet. What's mm -hmm. coming, you know, with the with the hair technologies of holograms and artificial intelligence and robotics. That's what our youngest generation is, is, is coming up in. So my book and my theory is this, is that the technologies that we come of age to and every generation, about every 20 years, another generation is popping and actually, in my book, I propose every 10 years, you see these generations popping. So you're part of two different technological generations, if you think about it. But as, you, as these pop, as these are popping, there are certain technologies that are emerging. You know, I, I think about myself uh, in, in the 70s uh, or in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, VCR technology was was emerging. And when you know, video cassette recording, and that was pretty cool. But there was, you know, VHS eventually won the day over over that uh, the old um, what was it called? Now I can't even think of the name of it. Um, the old oh, Betamax. There you go. Yeah, Remember yeah, Betamax? Yeah. Beta yeah. yeah. But it's the same thing happening today. DVD won the tipping point uh, uh, competition over Blu-ray. I mean, if you're still investing in Blu-ray, forget it. Blu-ray's dead. You know, DVD's dead. 
Uh, and, you know, even a pawn shop won't take a DVD anymore. If they do, it's very rare. You know, they're, they're trying to dump their DVDs. That's how I know if I call it obsolete technology. I have a whole chapter about obsolete technology. And, and this is technology that we no longer find useful. And it's all around us. When's the last time you used a fax machine, you know, yeah. or a photocopier? <laughs> You know, it just don't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. Uh, your, your body of work and your knowledge. And I know you do a lot of work within education mm -hmm. and, uh, I know teaching is, a uh, so many professions have always been challenging and I know teaching with COVID, uh, has become, uh, a little bit more challenging. Uh, historically, I think there's like one in six teachers that were thinking about leaving the profession with COVID. It's uh, one in three. Mm -hmm. How, what advice would you have if, if a school district were to come to you and, and saying, Hey, our, our teachers, uh, are struggling mm -hmm. and, uh, let's just focus on, on engagement, you know, to engage the, the learner and, uh, I'm guessing that education is just a little bit behind. I, I don't, I don't even want to speculate on it cause I'm not in that space, but how, yeah. How do you engage? How would you in, uh, walk a, a school district through engaging the, say it's like a high school where the kids are perhaps in this other space with the technology and then they have to come back into sitting in a class and kind of going through getting lectured at. And, um, yeah. so yeah, what, what advice would you give to, to a, a school that's struggling with this disconnect, so to say, of balancing technology with still, uh, trying to inspire and motivate uh, a learner? Well, and that's a, there, there's a lot to that yeah. question, obviously. And as an educator myself, uh, spending, uh, 15 years in the professorate, and I'm still a professor as well. I still uh, teach online. Uh, you know, what happened with COVID is very interesting when it comes to education. Uh, the, the children were actually a lot more pliable and adaptable than we think. Uh, they just they just picked up on the adults having problems with the online learning. Uh, you know, I've always said that once once we move to online, it's not going to be that difficult for for the majority of children out there to move online because they're already online. They already know how to work all that stuff. We've been giving them iPads in kindergarten for 20 years. I mean, they, they, from an educational perspective, the book is in a dying uh, format. I mean, that's print technology. And, and I like that idea, by the way. You know, as much as I like the feel of a book and I love the print technology and I, you know, that's my world as well. There's something about having your entire library on a thumb drive. You know, there's something about being able to go to Google Books. And I did this. This was my big COVID project was I started collecting uh, pre-1930, but really mostly pre-1900 books that Google has actually you know, made out there available. You can go and you know, download them for free. Read them for free. Read, read the history of George Washington at Washington as it was penned in, in 1820, not 19, uh, not 1950. I mean, there's there's a big difference in how we view George Washington in a matter of 100 years. And, and so those type of things. And when it comes back to your education issue, what, what would I say is I think there's something happening right now that's very good. And that is the rise of the millennial teacher. Uh, we're, we're seeing the, the big disconnect. Um, Gen X, for the most part, we, we're fairly uh, able to navigate to that. But what, where we have the real battle between technology and you have to understand a lot of your administrators tend to be over 50. It's, it's that over older administrator having issues with the, the younger teachers. Many of the younger teachers are, are really ready to go. They're, they're thinking very creatively through this entire COVID moment. I would encourage you, if you're, if you're a, a teacher out there listening to this and you're a younger teacher, continue to, to work through that and continue to, to be uh, creative and, and thinking in more transformative ways as far as how we can, how we can cause learning to happen uh, through, a, through a more um, a cyber uh, perspective or platform. Uh, because I think that's the future. I think what we're learning, just like in the work world, you know, we're having right now another COVID moment. We're having another little bit of an explosion where people are being asked to stay home. Well, look at, you know, uh, people are finding it now where, hey, I don't have to necessarily go 
uh, into a building in order to do my job. And employers are going, why are we paying for all this building that we don't use because all of our employees are now staying at home? And you're going to start to see these things crack and crumble and, and start to start to shift. And where it's going to happen is with the millennial that's coming up, they're going to really be there. And behind them, this class basically called Gen Z, which is a lousy label coming up behind them. They're right now just hitting college. And when they get through and they get out in the workforce in mass, uh, I think you're going to see transformative change. That's why I've marked 2030 as the year where everything tips in a big way. You know, we're, we're crusading, you know, cruising right towards that year 2030 and the technologies that are popping right now in artificial intelligence, robotics and holographic technology, you, we haven't seen anything yet. You think the last 20 years has been transformative? <laughs> Wait until you see what's coming in the, in the coming 20 years. Oh, man. Yeah, you get me all excited. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I get, I guess, you know, I, I worked as a nurse for 29 years mm -hmm. was, was my profession. And so I'm more of a touchy feely, emotional kind of guy. And, and I guess that's my probably being a little bit naive, perhaps of feeling like we, we have to have that time to really connect. And I guess I, that's where I have kind of space to grow in, in realizing that, that people are getting maybe that need met through the use of technology, which I know is happening for sure. I guess I get, uh, and worried's not the right word, but I guess I get a little bit worried that we're missing out and, and how I feel we've evolved as a species historically uh, being in the hunters and gatherers and coming together and helping everybody make their needs be met and feeling like we there is that emotional aspect that you just can't get you know, from this conversation that we're having, you know, say yes. we were having a heart really felt moment here, I would want to me and I'm just talking about myself and maybe this is my problem, but yeah. I would want to reach out and give you a hug and to and to touch you um, and connect yeah. that way. And I guess I just want to maybe what's the balance back to that word that I know is probably not in one that you love, but what's that that balance of having the benefit of technology. And again, this is amazing. You're in star Idaho. I'm in Vacaville. Mm -hmm. uh, we have listeners in 35 countries uh, yeah. listening to us. Um, so I'm not, you know, trying to sound ignorant that way, but I just want to make sure we don't go so far one side that we lose uh, this piece that's helped us e evolve, yeah. you know, mentally uh, and spiritually, you know, what would you say to, to something like that? Well, this is not a new problem, Jeff, first of all, uh, this historically. And that's one of the reasons I, I love to call myself a cultural historian is because I love to look back and you cannot look forward until you look back and find the patterns. That's what a weather forecaster does. They look at they look for patterns. They look for historical ebbs and flows. And then they go, oh, we're in this part right now. Has this happened before? And what was the outcome? And what's amazing is technology helps serve us serves us in, in many ways. It's, it's when we, um, let me, let me, let's just talk about this idea of, of, of social media and some of these things like, like uh, even what's happening right now, where we're connecting through uh, through a zoom uh, conversation, seeing each other face to face. Like you said, this never would have happened. You know, even think about this two or three years ago, I'm not sure we would be doing a zoom type of podcast interview like this. That's how quickly things can change. But what I find interesting about the, the new technologies, really the cyber technologies, is the, a lot of people are afraid that they're going to disconnect us. And there's some reality to that. I mean, I watched a family at a local restaurant the other day. All four of them, you know, were all on their phones, you know, playing on their phones while they're waiting for their dinner to come. They were not connected uh, to each other. But Think about how hyper connected they are to other people. Think about the other connections going on. We don't know the context. See, often I say, if you want to understand a person, you have to stand under them. It's easy for us to judge from a distance. I look at that family and go, oh, they're so disconnected. What we may not know is this. What if they were going through a family emergency and they were communicating to other family members outside? Now, I'm just conjecture. Mm hmm. But what if they were actually you know, doing something that was very family in that moment that they needed to do? And then they were going to put down the phones and spend the time together. You know, uh, when I look at technology today, I look at how it hyper connects us. 
for good or for bad, it hyperconnects us. We, you know, the, the whole fear that we were going to be alone in a bottom of a basement, you know, with our computer and our underwear and stuff like that. And, you know, just solely, totally disconnected. Social media has blown that whole model up. We are hyper-connected. Now, the problem with that is that it creates a narcissistic moment for us. And I think that's where this balance comes in. If we're not careful, there are certain personalities that become addicted to the thrill of having people like and share their stuff. And if you become addicted to that thrill, and I have to confess, I have an addictive personality. I, you know, there are times when I post something on Facebook and I go, oh, you know, this is something I've written. I've poured my heart into. I think it's great. And nobody likes it. And it's very easy for me to take that next step. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes me. Poor me. You know, and then you start going into this you know, pity party for yourself. I'm getting off of Facebook. Nobody likes me anyway. I don't have any friends. I'm just going see we take it to extremes. That's narcissism. You know, at its heart, it's narcissism and social media can very easily do that for those of us with addictive type of personalities to those things. On the other hand, for those who have more of a better balance of it, they have a better understanding of who they are. They've taken the long journey within, as Shirley MacLaine says, and they recognize that just because somebody doesn't like your post doesn't mean they don't like you or better yet, just because they don't like your post doesn't mean they don't like the post. I actually have a lot of people who say, I love what you write. I love all the things you put on Facebook. And I go, well, why don't you like them? And they go, oh, well, first of all, I just, I, that's not my thing. I just don't push like on stuff. I go, oh, see, to understand a person, we have to understand under them and, and maybe understand their context. And, you know, that just changes everything. Yeah. Um, and so our younger people, my biggest concern with the, the younger generation right now, when it comes to social media and stuff, is that many of them think that's the way to become rich and famous, you know, that if they just get the right YouTube channel, if they just get the right uh, TikTok thing going, that they can become rich and famous overnight because there are stars out there, uh, some as young as five years of age. On, on TikTok and YouTube and such. And, you know, you can make a lot of money in social media if you know how to do it right. Uh, yeah. But there's also a lot of ways to do it wrong and make money too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. You know, uh, uh, time will tell, you know, uh, how uh, the influence uh, good and bad uh, that it's going to have uh, uh, specifically on, on the younger people. Um, but I want to get into you a little bit more. And then uh, uh, there's something that I was reading about you. It would be a little interesting to share uh, as mm -hmm. well, but the show is called life's essential ingredients. And uh, so what, what would be one or, or two of the best things that you do for yourself to put you in a good position to, to all say win today, to enjoy this day, to, to live your purpose, to find the deep meaning, whatever words you want to use, but what are some maybe parts of your routine? What, what are things that you do yeah. that are essential in your life that perhaps a listener can say, oh man, that would, that kind of resonates with me. And maybe I'll incorporate that into what I do. Well, first of all, I'm a very spiritual person. Faith has been a part of, of who I am. And so, I, you know, the, the small things, I really believe that you, you got to do the small things. You got to do the things that uh, um, they're not necessarily hard. They're just they're just common. And for me, you know, I get up uh, today. I got, I got up like I normally do. And one of the first things I do is I spend just some time uh, listening. I like to listen to the Bible uh, as opposed to reading it. I just, for some reason, I like to put headphones in and just listen to it. And, and I have a, a daily Bible app that sends me a, a couple chapters from the Old Testament and a chapter from the New Testament. And, I did, and that way I read the entire Bible all the way through in a year. So that's one of the spiritual things that I do just to kind of set my day. Uh, and then I go on to Facebook and uh, I try to write something. I try to find something. I try to research. I got two or three um, um, blogs that come into me every single day. Uh, I, I, there are so many things out there you could read, but Seth Godin, if you're familiar with Seth Godin, uh, he has a daily blog that is probably one of the best ones out there. If you're a leader in, in particular. So I always read what Seth has to write. It's short. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's usually uh, packed with insight. Uh, it gets me thinking about something I need to do with my organization or with my, uh, uh, my work that I do. Uh, I also, um, uh, enjoy, uh, there's a, there's a guy out there who writes, um, a, a history blog called American minute. And it's just, uh, uh, very interesting things about American history. I enjoy that. Bill Federer. Uh, some people may not always agree with with, with some of his political uh, perspectives, but that's OK. I don't know if I agree with everybody or even myself sometimes on my own politics. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's it's um, but it's uh, he, he does lean more to the right is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. If you're if you want to get a perspective there. But his it's a very insightful history. Almost every day you get something from him. And that's pretty good. It's called the American Minute. Mm-hmm. Um but beyond that, you know, it's it's I, I think the the thing that I try to do every morning when I wake up and every night before I go to bed, one or the other, and sometimes both, is when I was in recovery, I, I dealt with an addiction of several years ago now. Um, I, I learned the serenity prayer. And it's not the little serenity prayer that you see on the plaques everywhere. That's only the first part of the serenity prayer. It's actually the longer version that uh, Reinhold Niebuhr actually wrote. Uh, and, you know, it's it's just, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I, I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I might be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. I pray that prayer when I get up. I pray that prayer when I go to bed Mm. and uh, usually with gratitude at the end of the day and with hope at the beginning. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it, man. That's like a showstopper right there. But I I, want to ask you one last question because I'm fascinated with so total uh <laughs> terrible segue um but uh, I, I see that you you like to pick and yeah uh, i'm sure you've seen american pickers oh yeah uh, that's i love that show and i know you're fascinated in historian um yeah, yeah that, talk about some of the cool things that you found and that you really appreciate that are part of your your collection and i'm liking just seeing uh everything in your room right there behind well, you you see the fan i gotta get the right shoulder here there we go there see the fan right yeah. there that's yeah. the one i picked up just last week in montana uh, I've been looking for a little electrical fan, something more industrial for my uh, my studio here. And, uh, you know, it was cool. But the one right next to the little lamp that's that's sitting next to it. There, there we go. Yeah, there. There we go. Point to the right way. The little lamp sitting next to it. I found that in a thrift shop for like three dollars. Uh, and, and that's what I like to do Saturday mornings. It's yard sale time. It's uh, I go out and I beat the, beat the yard sales and, uh, and, and I enjoy to me, that's, that's more relaxing. My wife enjoys it too. She's not much into the thrifts, but if I was to turn this camera around, my entire office is nothing but books. Mm-hmm. It is just filled with books. And I love history, obviously, but I also love theology. I love psychology. I love uh, biographies. Uh, I just love stories and I love reading, um, you know, perspectives and, 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 and trying just to understand people as a whole. Uh, I got a whole bunch of books over here on leadership, for example, and the stories of different companies. And, you know, it's just, it's just my life. But if, if I had, if I had another life, I probably would be a picker. Uh, I do resell some of my stuff. Um, I've got a couple of local antique dealers I work with and every now and then I find something that's, uh, I know they would like, and I, I know I really don't want it. So I'll flip it to them and make a few bucks in the process. But, you know, uh, I keep almost all the stuff I find. Cause I just like it. Uh, yeah. That's fun. Yeah. I have my, my brother-in-law, uh, who, who lives up in Camas, Washington collects, um, cast iron. Yeah. And so he goes all over the country, you know, looking and I think he's got over 500 pieces. Uh, and just, yeah, it's, it's just cool. There's a story behind everything. Um, and, uh, if you can capture that story, it's so cool of knowing that, man, that, that artifact, you know, people use to to live and, and bring nutrition into their home. If we're talking about this cast, I mean, I'm just I'm fascinated well, with with what it what it meant to people back in the day and um, having an appreciation for it still. Let me let me show off this one, and, and obviously your listeners who are just audio are not gonna be able to see this, but 
Here's one of my favorite little picks. I found this in the yard sale a few years ago. It's a candle. Wow. But it's a, it's a courting candle. And the way it works is the, uh, you would take the candle and you'd give the wick enough, you give it enough candle. And then you'd light the wick when the couple got together and when it went, and when it got down here, it would go out automatically. And that would mean it was time to go home. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is, these are the type of things that, you know, you just yeah. can't find everywhere and yeah. you just, you run into them. And I think I found this in yard sale, paid a buck for it, you know, but it's worth far more than that. It's, yeah. it's just a cool little court and candle. Yeah, no, that is so cool. Uh, I, I love that. Two more things. I'm going to let you go. Um, and with all your reading and all the work that you do, I love in your, in your introduction here, natural motivation. I want to explore that a little bit um, and, and put it in context with even, you know, in verse, you know, incentives and all that and how that stuff just mm -hmm. never, there's no sustainability to that. But uh, so, yeah, what that's apply, you apply it any which way you want to any context, but uh, uh, help the listeners gain some insight on how to tap into natural motivation and, and maybe steer clear of some of the other ways that, that just mm -hmm. aren't going to be sustainable. Yeah, this is pretty much my bread and butter, uh, conversation I have with a lot of leaders, teachers, parents as well. How do you motivate? And because a lot of times we motivate and manipulate really um, behavior through gimmicks and uh, guilt and shame. And, you know, if you do this, I'll give you that. If you don't do this, you're going to get that, you know, all those type of things. And they're all temporary and short, you know, short term. And, you know, I really believe that the best motivation is what really sets you up for long term change, transformative change in your life. And so, you know, several years ago, I was doing a lot of uh, study on this and I was reading the works of guys like uh, uh, Abraham Maslow, um, you know, on, on his hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. and, and, and such and other psychologists that wrote on, on natural motivation. But the problem is, is that it's very hard to remember all the, the inner needs that we have. I mean, I, I doubt very few people uh, even could in your audience could rip off high, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I wanted to think of a way to make it simple. And what I did was I realized I, I must have been hungry that day because my stomach growled. Mm -hmm. And when my stomach growled, I thought, oh, that's an inner need right there. And it became the acronym that I use. I call it the growls, G-R-O-W-L-S, the growls. And there are six human needs that if we just remember these needs, whether you're in the boardroom or the classroom or the bedroom with your kid, trying to motivate them to, to just behave, just remember these needs. The G is grace. It's a, it's a deep inner need. I think it's a spiritual need we all have for unconditional uh, surprise for unconditional beauty. Uh, there, there's, it's just, it's just, it's really messy. It's one of those needs. that's really hard to meet because we want to lead with the law and you don't lead with the law when you deal with people, uh, when you deal with grace, it is, is really a different type of thing. And we can unpack that if you want to, the, the others are much more definitive and much more um, easy to understand. The R is relationship. If you don't be long, it's so long and relationships are key in parenting. They're key in the classroom. They're key in the, in the corporate world and in the employment culture. Uh, it's about connection and collaboration and community conversation. Those are all key words. The O is ownership. Ownership is uh, empowerment. You know, it's, uh, it's about giving people choice. It's about letting them have control. It's about allowing them to contribute. The W is worth. Deep down, we all have a need to feel uh, valued and not just valued, but I also think validated. Uh, we want to have a voice. We want to share our vision. Now, what's interesting, I call those four needs the power needs. G-R-O-W, what's that spell? Grow. Yeah. Grow. Yeah. If you want to grow your child emotionally, spiritually, and, um, you know, just kind of get them, you know, to grow them. If you want to grow your staff, if you want to grow your classroom, if you, whatever you want to do, focus on grace, relationship, ownership, and worth. Those four power needs. The last two very quickly are the primitive needs. 
L is laughter. Deep down, you can't spell fundamental without the word fun to start it off. You know, it, it is fundamental. We have to laugh. When we laugh, we're literally uh, not just lighting up the room, but we're lighting up our brain to absorb and to be more creative, to be, to be just to, to be more open, uh, those type of things. The S, security. You know, Maslow talks about this a lot. Uh, you know, just we need to be, feel secure. That's one of the most basic needs. Uh, it's being secure in our e emotional state, being secure in our spiritual state, being secure in our physical state. So all that plays together. But that's the growls. And if you focus on those those needs, you won't have to feed, uh, you know, the, 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 the game and do the gimmicks and the games and all that stuff because people are naturally attracted to grace, relationship, ownership, worth, laughter, and security environments. Mm, I love it. I love it. Well, man, you have uh, so much knowledge and we could keep going on and on, And uh, <laughs> but I want to be respectful of your time. And I, I end every show with a quote from John Alston that says, the only thing you take with you when you're gone is what you leave behind. Mm -hmm. And let's fast forward, you know, 40 years for you. Uh, you've lived an incredible life. You've traveled all over the world. You've helped people find deep meaning to their life. What is it that you want? You're on your deathbed. Uh, you're surrounded by uh, those uh, that have been in your life. What is it you want to leave with them? Yeah, I've already said it. I want to leave one thing, grace. I, I want to leave grace. I want to leave uh, an, uh, just a moment of, of peace because there's peace and grace there's love and grace. There's uh, joy and grace. I just want to leave grace. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And that is one <laughs> of those words that, um, again, I think you could talk a whole hour, if not longer yeah. on breaking that down. And so listeners, we've been, uh, uh, graced with Rick's presence uh, for this past uh, hour or so. Uh, it's been an incredible episode. I can't thank you enough for, for giving us your time uh, and your knowledge and for all the other work that you do. Uh, any last message you want to throw out uh, to the listeners? Yeah, actually, I want to grace your listeners and you as well with a free digital book of mm -hmm. Gentech. So I'm going to give uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll send you a link and you can put it up there with this show. If you would like to read Gentech, the only thing I ask is that you go to your favorite bookseller, if it's Amazon, whatever it might be, and just give me a good review on it. You know, help me out. But uh, let's um, let's get this and start spreading the word. And if you want to buy the print copy, that actually gives me a little bit of grocery money as well. But uh, I want to grace all of your listeners with a free copy of Gentech. Uh, and man, you too. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I'm definitely uh, gonna gonna read that one. I'm a big reader like you. Uh, listeners, thanks for tuning in to another episode. And you know how we do it. We out, baby. Boom. That just happened.